This picture represents an artist's logarithmic scale conception of the observable universe with the solar system at the center, then the Oort cloud, then the Milky Way galaxy and nearby galaxies, then the early cosmic web, then the cosmic microwave background radiation, and then the Big Bang's invisible plasma is on the very edge. In the following video, Dr. Neil Turok explains the illustration in more detail. So here's a rather beautiful picture of the whole universe uh, that we can see. And uh, we're in the middle, in the solar system, um, going around the sun. But there's this vast expanse of space full of galaxies. And of course, as we look outwards in space, we're seeing backwards in time, just because light takes time to reach us. So as, as we get to the outer reaches of the region we can see, we see this uh, cosmic web, the structure of the universe as it began to form at early times. And we go further back, there's a dark stripe, which is the Dark Ages, we call it. Um, and just before the Dark Ages is a bright red ring. That red ring is the hot plasma of the very early universe, uh, the earliest thing we can see. And if we could probe through it, as we will be able to do uh, one day with gravitational waves, we will be able to see right back to the singularity itself, the moment when space and matter emerged. And so that's the larger scale. Uh, we know of. It's about 10 to the power 25 uh, uh, meters. The tiniest scale we know of in the universe is what we call the Planck scale. And that you can see right at the edge of the picture. You see, if we go look out as far as we can, go backwards in time, following the universe back to the singularity. Imagine we are, so we are following a light wave uh, that's traveling through this plasma. The whole universe is shrinking, the light wave is shrinking, it'll become more and more energetic. The, mo the Planck time is the moment those light waves are so energetic that two light waves encountering each other would form a black hole. And so they would disappear. Uh, we can't describe them after that, they'd be inside a black hole. That's called the Planck scale, a scale so tiny that if you try to squeeze a light wave into it, it has enough energy to collapse the space around it and make a black hole. So um, that's called the Planck length, and that's, that's about uh, 10 to the minus 35 meters. So we can go from 10 to the plus 25 to 10 to the minus 35. Now, where are we? Well, the size of a living cell is about 10 to the minus 5, which is halfway between the two. In mathematical terms, we say it's a geometric mean. We live in the middle between the larger scale in physics, define, which defines the region we will ultimately see, and the tiniest scale, uh, which is so tiny we can't even talk about space and time on smaller scales than that. So we're, we're in the messy middle. Not to get too picky with Dr. Torek's 10 to the power of 25 number for the largest scale, but when we look up the observable universe, we find that the largest scale is 10 to the power of 26. Almost 10 to the power of 27. And when we look up the Planck scale, it does indeed match up to 10 to the minus 35. With that small correction, that puts the geometric middle at 10 to the minus 4 meters instead of 10 to the minus 5 meters, as Dr. Torok had said. 10 to the minus 4 meters happens to be the smallest that an unaided human eye can see, and also happens to be the approximate size of a human egg. This following video goes through the scale of the universe, starting with Planck length and going all the way to the length of the observable universe. I'll zoom through 
to 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 4, which is the middle of the scale. Now I'll zoom through to 10 to the power of 27 meters, which is the observable length of the universe. And here's the end of the scale at 10 to the 27. I find it very interesting that both human vision and a human egg would be almost directly in the geometric metal of all possible sizes. This following video, which shows the mapping of the cosmic microwave background radiation by the Planck satellite, is very good for getting the centrality of the Earth in the universe across. following article, Ross Anderson states, It occurred to me that our cosmos is once again a spirit. Earth has been demoted in recent centuries. It no longer enjoys its former status as the still center of all that is, but it does still sit in the middle of our observable cosmos, the sphere of light that we can detect with our telescopes. Gaze into the spheres reaches from any point on Earth's surface and you can see light coming toward you in layers from the stars and the planets that circle them, from the billions of galaxies beyond, and the final layer of light, the afterglow of the Big Bang. The following video is also very good for getting the centrality of the Earth in the universe across. Here is a still shot from the preceding video. Interestingly, in the Bible, thousands of years before the cosmic microwave background radiation was discovered, we find in Proverbs, while as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primeval dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. And in Job we find, He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. When I point this evidence out to atheists, they are quick to point out that due to the four-dimensional space-time that general relativity is built upon, that any three-dimensional point in the universe can be considered central to the universe. The first evidence that the universe had a beginning is the expanding universe. And I'll explain it like this. Here's the universes near us. And we happen to be this little asterisk right in the middle. And we take a snapshot, we see, um, I mean, these are galaxies. What did I say? Universe? These are galaxies that are near us, all right? 
And our galaxy is the asterisk in the middle. If we take a snapshot, it looks like this. If we take a snapshot a little later, it looks like this. And still later, it looks like this. And what do we see? We see that the galaxies near us are receding away at a relatively slow pace. The galaxies that are far away are receding away at a much faster pace. And this is exactly what you would see if you expect, if, you, if there was an ex some kind of explosion or something right at the, at the middle. The galaxies nearby would be moving away slowly. The galaxies far away would be moving away quickly. So you might say, ah, oh, that means we're the center of the universe. Look at that. Well, let's make this the center of the universe and see what happens. So now the picture looks like this. And you see the same thing, that the galaxies nearby are moving away slowly and the galaxies farther away are moving away faster. And one of my kids, I like to use this illustration. Here's the uh, universe, all in a balloon. And these little dots are the galaxies of the universe. And as the universe expands, the galaxies move farther and farther away from each other, with the ones nearby moving away at a slower rate and ones far away moving at a higher rate. Sky surveys using up to 2 million galaxies repeatedly show no central location and a satellite found the temperature of the cosmos to be the same in all directions. The grass ain't greener on the other side of the cosmos. Experiments have also shown that these worlds inhabit a four-dimensional universe made of space and time. One, galaxies were squished on the fabric of the cosmos. We represented them as dots of whiteout and the surface of a balloon as the fabric of the cosmos, which we then blew as though we were expanding the universe. Galaxies and even vacuum have been squished on the surface of the balloon. They have only width and length. What is inside and outside the balloon? The other dimension that wasn't squished. Time. The radius of the balloon is the time axis. So what's inside the balloon? The past. And what's outside the balloon? The future. And although every three-dimensional spot being central in a four-dimensional space-time universe is certainly very interesting, nonetheless, recently it has been found that there are anomalies in the cosmic microwave background radiation that very surprisingly line up with the solar system and with the Earth in particular. At the 14 minute mark of this following video, Max Tegmark, an atheist, finally admits post Planck 2013 that the cosmic microwave background radiation anomalies do indeed line up with the Earth and the solar system. Now this brings us back to Max. Remember, back in 2011, Max said, ah, I don't think these alignments are, there's probably a mistake there. There couldn't be any connection between our solar system and the cosmic microwave background. Well, this is now post-Planck. Right. We went back. Late, later data, folks. 2013, two years later. I've spent, I've spent two years emailing Max back and forth about this stuff. We've talked mm -hmm. about this. And Now listen to what, first of all, Kate asks him, or Kate reads from the script, and then listen to what Max says about these weird alignments with our local neighborhood. Roll All right, let's clip. roll this clip. But what about the alignments with the ecliptic and equinoxes, which Lawrence Krauss had said would mean we were really the center of the universe? We asked Max Tegmark if Planck's results had convinced him that the axis of evil actually was aligned with our ecliptic and equinoxes. I have, to conf I, I have to confess that I was bothered by the fact that the axis of evil seemed l linked to a special direction in our solar system. And something in my gut was telling me that this might, even though I greatly trust the people on the DoubleMap team, point to something fishy in, in their analysis. 
But I also feel very strongly that I have to actually override my gut by using my brain and by looking at data. And now we have completely independent data with better detectors, completely different people seeing the same thing. So there's just no way we can blame this on the double. Moreover, there's nothing within general relativity or special relativity that dictates that the Earth cannot be the still center of the universe. In fact, within general relativity, the observer is given a privileged frame of reference, and as with special relativity. In fact, special relativity was born out of the Michelson-Morley experiment in which it was found that there was no way to tell that the Earth was moving through an ether. Moreover, in the following video, named Privileged Planet, we find that the very conditions that make Earth hospitable to intelligent life also make it well suited to viewing and analyzing the universe as a whole. Moreover, this paper found that the laws of physics are fine-tuned for life, intelligent life like human life. And this paper found that the chemistry of the universe is of particular benefit for intelligent life like human life. In this paper, leading evolutionary scientists admit that we have no evolutionary explanation of human language. In fact, Darwinists have no evolutionary explanation for the generation of any non-trivial information. In the following video, at the 53 minute mark, John Lennox relates how mass energy is derivative from information and how life is based on information. The very end of this age. We live in the information age. And it's fascinating when you begin to study life. They used to think it was like blobs of jelly or jello as you call it. Now we discover that the genetic basis of life is linguistic. There is a word, but it's not only linguistic. It's mechanical engineering of the most unbelievable sort. And tomorrow night, there's going to be a lecture by Dr. Tour, who's here tonight. And he is going to give you insight into just the bewildering complexity of the nanotechnologies in biology. But the important thing is, which even chemists with the most brilliant minds cannot reproduce. And I encourage you very much to come to him. I'll hide behind him because I'm not an expert in these things. I just want to pick up one thing, and it's this. Language, as I said at the beginning, fascinates me. And so I'm faced with these two worldviews. One of them says in the beginning was mass energy, the particles, or now the favorite is nothing or a quantum vacuum, which isn't nothing, or something like that. And everything else is derivative, including mine. There's another world view. It goes like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be that came to be. See the difference? This is saying that information, logos, the word, energy, intelligence, command, it's a whole spectrum of meanings. The word is a personal God behind the universe. That's the primary thing in the universe. It's not mass energy at all. Mass energy is, der is derivative. And now, for the first time in history, we've got 21st century physics which is pushing information right into the center point of importance. Biology is doing the same thing because it's adapting the language of theoretical computer science to describe what's going on. And isn't it fascinating that information is not material? It's carried on material.
but it itself isn't materialism. That's an end to my mind of materialism. And there are some scientists even suggesting at the level of physics, they put it rather quaintly, they say it's bit before it rather than it before bit. In other words, they're asserting the primary nature of information, yes, no, zero, one, quantization of fundamental things. This is fascinating. It's hard for me to imagine a more convincing proof that we are made in the image of God than finding both the universe and life itself are information theoretic in their foundational basis, and that we, of all the creatures on earth, uniquely possess an ability to understand and create information. Moreover, quantum mechanics goes one step further and tells us that reality does not exist until we look at it. In this paper, we find that reality doesn't exist until we measure it. Delayed choice quantum experiment confirms. The excerpt reads, it proves that measurement is everything. At the quantum level, reality does not exist if you are not looking at it. There are several papers and there is a video that gets the point across following. You ain't looking, it's like a wave. When you are looking, it's like a particle. When you are not looking, there are waves of possibility. When you are looking, then there are particles of possibility. A particle, which we think of as a solid thing, really exists in a so-called superposition, a spread out wave of possible locations. And it's in all of those at once. The instant you check on it, it snaps into just one of those possible